In May of 2018, Rooster Teeth announced a variety of new shows coming exclusively to the first program. They dubbed the month of May Pilot Month and set out to release pilot episodes for five new shows, being Branded, Gork's Quest, Achievement Haunter, Million Dollars Butt Animated, and Murder Room. If interest was high enough in a show, a full season could be ordered carrying the possibility of it becoming free to watch instead of being first exclusive. Since then, exactly three years have passed. What happened to these shows? Have they been moderately successful or met with cancellation? Let's start from the beginning. On May 3rd, a tweet was published under Rooster Teeth's Twitter account showing this image in the following text. Fans immediately focused on Achievement Haunter, as the show idea was teased on multiple occasions during Achievement Hunter's podcast Off Topic, and, judging by a few of the responses, it was clear there was a favorite among the shows. Five days later, on the 8th, a journal was posted by Evan Bregman, Rooster Teeth's current head of business operations. Due to the community site's recent rebuild, the journal is unviewable, but thankfully Reddit user Maverick Mac provided a full text archive in the Pilot Month trailer thread. The journal mentions the silence from Rooster Teeth's production department and states that during that time they have been working on these five shows. It also says that the pilots will be exclusive for first members to sample and could become public depending on interest. On the same day, a proper trailer for the month was released on the website and it showcased snippets and clips of each show, and a tweet was released shortly after linking to the trailer and Evan's post mentioned before. Then, two days later, the first pilot aired. On May 10th, Branded, Episode 101, Infancy Stages, aired. The show is created and directed by Marshall Rimmer, known for being a Rooster Teeth editor, writer, and actor in some series like Nature Town and RT Shorts. Some of the cast includes Mike Capes and Ted Meredith, both making their first appearance in a Rooster Teeth production, Christina Parrish, Byron Brown, Bernie Burns, Mika Burton, and others. Branded follows the character Clark, who is assumingly trying to win over his ex-girlfriend again after a recent breakup. His first step towards redemption is interviewing for an advertising agency contagion, and surprise, his interview ends up being a pitch meeting with a client. During the meeting, Clark accidentally closes out of the slideshow presentation, which causes a YouTube video of a pregnant woman giving birth in the back of a car to play. Surprisingly, the client notices the view count on the video and orders the agency to create a fake viral video with subtle adverts of their product. I also find it funny that Rooster Teeth exists in the branded universe as all of the YouTube suggested videos found in the background of this shot originate from RT Shorts and Red vs. Blue. Because of Clark's unexpected success, he is hired as the International Technology Executive of Regional Networks very smooth guys, and shortly notices that this legitimate professional company may not be as legit as it seems. The crew comes to realize that the video needs to be shot and completed by tomorrow and they begin to scramble for ideas. Almost instantly, they settle with their coworker Jane faking a birth at a children's playground and using a baby doll as a stand-in, if you will. During the filming of the video, Clark finds himself suddenly playing the role of the EMT as the expected actor was unavailable due to some legal issues. Yeah, I actually forgot to mention, I'm um, actually not allowed within 500 feet of a playground, so... His ex-grace notices him at the park and mistakes his outfit as his job's uniform, stating she was proud to see that he chose to go into medicine. Now, as the two are reuniting, Jane, in the background, tries to get into character and begins to binge eat donuts. She then begins to choke on one. To convince Grace of his occupation, Clark rushes over to her and begins to perform the Heimlich maneuver. The crew decides to pull an audible on the whole thing and quickly squeeze in their convincing product placement. As soon as Jane is saved, the baby doll falls out and makes its way down a slide. Grace then realizes what is actually happening here and is not impressed. After filming the video, the crew publishes it without the client's approval or review. Due to some poor camera angles, news programs begin to report on it as viewers are led to perceive that the video is real and that it results in the death of an infant. Pleased with themselves, Contagion meets with the client once more and are told that they caused a major PR disaster and won't be compensated. 
Keith, Contagion's last investor, pays the crew a visit and states that the company needs to make some leadership changes. Clark chimes in to vouch for Brody, the current CEO, but unintentionally finds himself the new head of the company. Fans quickly began to sing their praise for the show, and the reception was almost unanimously positive. Once Pilot Month was ultimately over, another journal was posted on June 20th. The author and contents of the journal are once again missing due to the community site rebuild, and unfortunately there isn't a proper archive this time. Instead, I'll be using a TLDR version of it written by Reddit user Asharks3 under the journal's Reddit thread. The journal supposedly stated that Brandon will receive a proper first season and that seven more episodes will make their way to first members. Now, three years have passed, and that did not happen. So, what happened to the show? Well, Rooster Teeth is known for having shows never be officially cancelled as they never know if they could bring it back someday. In Brandon's case, no additional announcements were made on the status of the show. No news about upcoming film dates, cancellation, nothing. In fact, the most recent news about the show is that journal stating that it is getting seven more episodes. Now, will, will Brandon potentially make a return? I mean, one could think so. 2018 and 2019 were busy years for the live action department with shows like The Weird Place, Bloodfest, Common Ground, and Hardcore Tabletop, to name a few, entering production. Perhaps it was just delayed to accommodate the busy schedule? However, this seems unlikely. In cases like this, we are just left to assume what has happened to the show, and it is safe to say it is most likely cancelled, especially with Marshall, the director, leaving Rooster Teeth the same year the pilot released. As it seems right now, the show might not get any more steam. Oh, and after Marshall left, he went to go work for the company Forge that specializes in branded productions and commercial campaigns. What goes around comes around, huh? Looking for an adult man who is available to roleplay with young child. Very young. Were there typos? On May 15th, the pilot episode for Gork's Quest was released. The show is created, directed, and written by Todd Womack, known for being, well, a director and writer for Rooster Teeth. He is also the creative producer for Broadcast and has made appearances in some RT shorts, the Extra Life live streams, and other places. The episode features three contestants, being Max Crumkey, Alfredo Diaz, Jeremy Dooley, and Chad James being the co-host of the show. The story goes that scientists tried to create a supercomputer that could answer any question, but accidentally made a useless hunk of junk that could only generate random questions. They fittingly called it the Generator of Random Questions, or Gork. Those same scientists trapped Gork in his own universe, as he was so annoying, and promised his freedom when he knew the answer to every question. Like on the spot and jump, Gork's Quest is another game show, with this one specializing in hypothetical discussion. The rules and premise are simple. The show goes through four rounds and awards contestants Gork coin, the show's equivalent to points, based on their performance. Round one, humans are useless, tasks the players to answer a hypothetical robot-related question. Whoever comes up with the best answer, as voted by Gork, receives some Gork coin. Round two, best worst, tasks the players to answer an unthemed hypothetical question as poorly as they can. Gork then picks the best worst answer and eliminates that player. This repeats until one person is left, where that person is then declared the winner. Does that sound confusing? Because it is. The contestants get tripped up over it all the time, and it is really funny to see. Round 3 is a moment with Gork. This is a bonus round as no Gork coin is given. In the round, Gork just simply proposes a new concept for the human world and invites the contestants in for discussion. Lastly, round 4, question yourself, has the contestants each pick a topic they think Gork needs to learn about. It will then ask the player questions about it, and whoever enlightens Gork the most in 45 seconds is awarded more Gork coin. Oh, and just like on the spot, Gork coin can be awarded at random in varied increments. John. Hey, John. <laughs> oh no picture required. Let's, let's just go ahead and give 2,000 points. For nice dick, boy! <laughs> After Gork announces the episode's winner, it then reveals how much information it learned during the duration of the session, and compares it to how much more it needs to learn in order to be freed. Of course, a lot of progress needs to be made.
After the show's initial viewing, reception was fairly positive, although many people thought the show would benefit from the exclusion of Gork himself. Fans admitted that he was just too annoying, paralleling the reason scientists trapped it in the first place. It showed some promise, and people were hopeful for it. Later, on June 20th in that aforementioned journal, Gork's quest was announced to be successful, and the show would receive four more episodes free to the public, and that it was going to be reworked a little bit. Now, unlike Branded, Gork's Quest did receive those four episodes. You can go watch them yourself on YouTube or the Rooster Teeth site if you so desire. The new episodes were announced via Twitter on November 6th. It stated that the episodes would come out a day after each other starting on the 12th and going through the 15th. That time frame was later dubbed as Gork Week. This is, did you not hear? This is Gork Week. This is, yeah, that's, it's Gork Week, but this is my set. Fuck off, robot. Some of the reworked ideas were immediately noticeable, with Gork's updated design and audio being a key example. <laughs> What up, fools? Hey, yeah. hey, hey. How's it going, dude? Well, we got money. Oh, hey, Chris. How oh. you doing, buddy? Another instance would be the human co-host becoming a rotating position as different cast members would fill in to take the spot. No new games were added, but the game Humans Are Useless was renamed three times over the course of four episodes, starting with You Got a Point, Sports Drink, and DNA Party. The game's rules relatively remain the same, with the exception that the questions are no longer robot-themed. Some stuff was even cut entirely. The progression graph at the end of the show no longer appeared, and the bonus round, A Moment with Gork, was completely gutted. The Gork coin system was also changed, making points useless. The amount of coins given to a winner of the game was seemingly random, usually between 999 coins or 1 coin. Heck, 7,500 coins were given out at random at one point. This ended up removing most competitive aspect from the game. But as it still stands, Gork's Quest only consists of the same three games, Best Worst, Question Yourself, and DNA Party. After this mini-series run, it was up to the community if a proper, longer run was warranted. Reactions to the show were fairly mixed. Many found it entertaining with its quick and witty delivery, but others found it unnecessary with its repetitiveness, lack of competition, and annoying hosts. Because of this, Gork's Quest has not received any new episodes or updates. No news have been made regarding extra content or a proper cancellation. So sorry, Gork. Looks like you aren't going to be freed anytime soon. The show is an odd inclusion in the Rooster Teeth catalog, but it carries a nice piece of company history with it. And personally, I like to imagine an alternate universe where Gork's Quest filled in on the spot's place after it ended instead of Chump. I've gotten finger blasted while watching Despicable Me once. <laughs> On May 17th, Achievement Haunter, Yorktown Memorial Hospital aired. The show was directed by Daniel Fabello, who is known for his role in some of Rooster Teeth's most notable productions. He directed some Immersion in Day 5 episodes, co-wrote and co-directed Laser Team 2, and helped with audio and editing for Ruby. This episode's cast features Jeff Ramsey, Jack Patillo, Michael and Lindsay Jones, Gavin Free, and Jeremy Dooley, all known for their role as cast members for Achievement Hunter. The show follows the cast of AH going to middle of nowhere Texas to hunt ghosts. In this case, the gang pays Yorktown a visit to investigate the memorial hospital known for its bizarre paranormal phenomenon. The episode follows a format. It begins with the crew gathered around a campfire as they tell some of the stories and legends known about the area. They discuss the history of the building, some prolific characters involved with the place, and some people's ghost sightings and experiences. As these stories are being told, the viewer is watching a reenactment of those instances being portrayed by the crew themselves. The cast is forced to lip read in those shots as the audio used is still from the campfire. Jeff refers to this as the drunk history portion of the show, referring to the Comedy Central program that follows the same storytelling style. Next, the crew arrives on site and prepares for the investigation. They do a quick debrief about everyone's duties for the night and some of the tech they will be using. Then, people are split into groups and sent to find some of the characters that have been mentioned in the folklore. Achievement Haunter's tagline is that they don't play nice like the other ghost shows. Instead of consoling or making the spirits comfortable, they antagonize, threaten, and overall piss them off enough for them to show a sign of their existence. A pissed off ghost, a scared ghost, is a powerful ghost. A powerful ghost is a dangerous ghost. And a dangerous ghost gets us views. Now, after everyone is told their duty for the night, anything goes. The rest of the show is overall improvisation as the cast are free to do whatever they want. Yes, they have to somewhat complete their task in one way or another, but how they do so is up to them. 
One group needed to find the operating room used by a well-known inexperienced doctor. They then tried to invoke the spirit by provoking and insulting their poor practices. Another group had to find a children's book loved by a little girl who was a previous patient that died in the facility. They reread the book out loud in hopes of hearing an outcry from her. A third group was sent to play some good cop, bad cop in hopes of luring in additional patients and snapping at them to cause an encounter. Lastly, at the very end, Jeff is sent to the chapel, which housed nuns who were against the desecration of human skin with tattoos. The crew assumed that his presence alone was enough to potentially cause some feedback. Lastly, at the very end of the night, the investigation wraps and everyone regroups to hold one final debrief. They all present their findings to each other and decide if the place is haunted or not, depending on their discoveries. They give their verdict, pack up, and head home. The episode was met with extremely high praise and compliments. Due to this show being teased a lot more prior to the pilot month announcement, hype surrounding it was fairly high, and it's safe to say it lived up to it. Because of this, in the June 20th journal announcing the results, Achievement Hunter was promised more episodes and a proper season, all of which exclusive for first members. Of course, the announcement that Achievement Haunter was to become a first member exclusive show was met with some criticism, as many wanted the show to become free to watch for the public. Luckily, fans understood that due to the production value, doing so would not be beneficial. From that June 20th journal to July 29th, fans were impatiently waiting for an announcement on the release date. Then during off topic number 139, the official date was revealed and carried with it one of the best moments in that podcast history. Trevor's gonna let us know when Achievement Haunter is gonna be released. This cake is really good. <laughs> Everyone good? Everyone done? October 31st! Halloween! Boom! Happy Halloween! Researching all that, but I'd, I'd love to know where people want us When's to the go. first episode coming out? Can we say that? <laughs> <laughs> all right! <laughs> Shortly after that beautiful announcement, Achievement Haunter was given a panel during RTX Austin on August 3rd, and another during RTX London on September 16th. Then, a month and a half later after that, the day finally came. The first video aired on October 31st with a new episode releasing weekly through December 12th. However, some changes were made to the show, with none of them really leaving a negative influence. Instead of being confined to Texas, the crew was able to venture to places outside the state. As an example, they traveled to Shreveport, Louisiana for the auditorium in Oakland Cemetery, and even West Wicumbee, England for the Hellfire Caves. The show got a proper introduction sequence with its own custom music. It was also confirmed that the cast would not be fixed and different members would rotate in between episodes. Members officially got their own character title, with some examples as Jeff being the fearless leader, Jack being the skeptic, Jeremy being the muscle, and Gavin being the bait. And lastly, the campfire portion no longer took place around an actual campfire, and instead is done in a custom treehouse set made specifically for the show. Other than that, it was good old classic Achievement Haunter. After the first season of 8 episodes wrapped, some bonus footage and bloopers were published, and an hour-long recap episode was released, which acted as a retrospective to the season shown in a podcast format, and Achievement Hunter tweeted that they accidentally brought home one of the ghosts. Now all jokes aside, now it was up to the company to decide whether or not another season should be done. Reception of the first season was overwhelmingly positive. It was so positive that the crew would already be filming the next season only a week after filming the recap episode. The show was given another panel during RTX 2019 on July 6th, then shortly after, season 2 was properly announced on July 19th via Twitter, and again on November 11th with a precise release date. This new season contained 8 more episodes, which premiered January 30th, 2020, and aired weekly until March 19th. Again, some changes were made in between seasons, with the most notable being the show's name change from Achievement Haunter to just simply Haunter. Production value was noticeably increased, especially with some of the pranks they were able to pull off. Unlike the first season that housed 8 episodes for 8 haunts, this one had 8 episodes for 5 haunts instead. Three of the locations had double the amount of content and were split into two parts instead. Trevor made his debut to the show, appearing in a couple of the episodes. And more haunts took place outside the United States, with one location being in East Sussex, England, and Melbourne, Australia. In addition to that, none of the episodes took place in Texas. They were either filmed across the country or internationally. Once the second season was in the books, some bonus content and blooper reels were published, and another recap special was released. Then the question was asked again, is another season possible? 
Well, this was tricky to answer. It was noted that Haunter cost an extreme amount of money to produce. Jeff stated in the recap that the show cost around $800,000 to $1 million to produce a season. Due to that hurdle, the show would need to be picked up by a network or television station for that to be feasible. And because of this, it was officially, unofficially announced that the show was done. Jeff hugged Daniel, saying it was an honor for them all to be working with him, and thanks were shared. Hunter is met with the exact same fate Day 5 was given years prior. Unfortunately, there is one last nail in the coffin. Daniel Fabello, the director of Haunter, was part of the September 2019 layoffs, where Rooster Teeth was forced to cut out 13% of the company, totaling 50 people. This could potentially explain why USS Hornet is the only episode in the entire series to not be directed by him. With Daniel no longer with the company, a new season seems extremely unlikely now. Regardless of all of that, Haunter is and will remain as one of the best and top-notch productions Rooster Teeth and Achievement Hunter have ever made, and it gladly earns that title. As of writing this, the entire first season is available to watch free on the website, and I highly encourage you to do so. All right, Lindsay, what are you going to be doing tonight? I'm looking to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> On May 29th, the pilot episode for Million Dollars But Animated was released. The show was directed by Blaine Gibson, who is known for his various roles in the live action department. He was even the director of the original series. This episode features Gus Sirola, Bernie Burns, and Gavin Free. The show is an animated adaptation of the original series called Million Dollars But. The show garnered its own success, with five seasons being produced, several dedicated panels at RTX, and an official card game being made. The game required $10,000 of crowdfunding for it to be feasible. The goal was reached in two minutes. Overall, the game received $1,353,024 in crowdfunds, 130 times more than its original goal. A normal episode of the show has three cast members sit around a table and discuss a formatted hypothetical question. You receive $1 million, but you are left with a specific curse. Would you take the money? A personal example I just made up would be, uh, you get a million dollars, but for the next five years, every piece of furniture with any type of cushion in it is actually just rock solid instead. Would you take that money? Each person provides their own scenario, then everyone is open for discussion. Potential problems are highlighted and clever solutions are thought about. After all, you have a million dollars now. You could probably afford to get some contraptions to counteract the curse. As everyone is talking, the viewer is seeing reenactments done by the cast, just like in Haunter. Following all of that, everyone decides if they would actually accept the cash. The animated pilot follows a very similar format, but a lot is missing. Instead of each member providing a scenario, only one is discussed. Bernie is the only person to bring forth the situation. Next, of course, the episode shows animated reenactments, allowing it to not be confined by real-world physics in its presentation. Then. It just ends. None of the three members end with their final verdict on if they'd take the money or not. The reception from fans reflected those major issues. May said that they wanted to see more, but only if it was a supplement to the original series instead of its own thing entirely. Other comments were that the slapstick of physical humor cannot be beat and shouldn't be replaced, and some even remarked that MDB has been done to death already. Regardless, in the June 20th journal, MDB Animated was promised a few more episodes with the intent of them being on Facebook as the social media audience allegedly fit the show better. Five months later, the second episode of the series, Animated Holiday Special, was announced on November 25th, 2018, and was released three days later on the 28th. The episode housed the same cast from the pilot, with the exception of Jeff Ramsey replacing Gavin Spot. In addition to the change in crew, the episode was a proper return to format and fixed the biggest issues seen in the pilot. The video's timeline was reverted back to normal with all three members presenting a scenario, discussing in depth about it, then giving their verdict at the end. One difference is that all the plots are related to the holidays, as evidenced by the title. This isn't the first time this has been done, as the first half of season 5 was restricted to specific themes as well. Reception was a lot better, but it still had its negativity. Many reassured that the live action episodes fit the show better, as it was interesting to see the cast act out, as best they could, the same stuff they came up with previously. Some also theorized that the episode was only made to advertise the MDB card game for the holidays, which had its fair share of advertisements throughout the video. After the second episode released, silence. 
No more episodes have come out, and as far as I know, no exclusive clips were released on Facebook as promised. I looked around and all I could find was a clip from the holiday episode. Additionally, no news regarding upcoming episodes or a proper cancellation were made. Once again, we are left to assume the status of the show, and personally, I think it could make some returns down the line. I really don't think the original MDB series is over, even though we are currently in the biggest break in between seasons, and if it were to be renewed, it wouldn't be surprising if a few special animated episodes were in there. All we have to do now is wait and see. You're rolling fair. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh okay, okay, okay. Well, I got it. Okay. What a twist! On May 31st, Murder Room Toothpick Field was released. The show was created, executively produced, and written by Patrick Salazar, Rooster Teeth's Director of Broadcast Operations. He is known for his oversight in most podcast productions and his rare appearance in videos. The show is hosted by John Reisinger, best known for being the host of On The Spot. This episode's cast includes Becca Frazier, Barbara Dunkelman, Gus Sarola, and Blaine Gibson. The show takes place in the distant future when the justice system is now run by a supercomputer named Jessica that can calculate culprits with a 99.2% accuracy rate. However, law still states that humans must be tried by humans. So, a group of four individuals have 30 minutes to run through the evidence, interview suspects, and sentence someone to the death penalty. Once their decision is made, the selected suspect is killed and Jessica reveals if they caught the right person. It's kind of like a game show that specializes in a focus of critical thinking and decisive reasoning. Viewers are also encouraged to grab a pen and paper and play along themselves. Before the timer starts, the counselor are given the three suspects and some possible information they can obtain. They then see the known timeline of events that led up to the body of the victim being found and are asked to put one suspect on a back burner. After doing so, they cannot receive any information about that person until they completely exonerate one of the other two suspects. After the list of three is given, the known timeline is presented, and one suspect is put aside, the timer begins. As time counts down, the council tries to obtain as much information and testimonies as they can. As mentioned prior, suspects have their own unique set of possible information to obtain. Some examples are the person's text messages, statements from individuals, the timeline of their social medias, and even a physical item they can run fingerprints and scan DNA for. But by far the most notable example is a phone call with the suspect themselves. The council can have a verbal conversation with another Rooster Teeth cast member who is in character as their associated suspect. This part of the show alone baffles me due to the logistics. The actor or actress has to know a slew of information in the event that they are asked a corresponding question. Also, they assumingly can't improvise too much as it could unintentionally create red herrings. After the five minute warning is given, the cast needs to begin their final decision. A unanimous vote needs to be made before the time runs out, otherwise all three suspects run free. Upon selecting their suspect, Jessica the supercomputer reveals who the culprit is. The episode then promptly ends. Reception for the show was really positive. Some commenters mentioned potential improvements to the formatting, saying that 30 minutes was a little too short to find enough information, and others asked for a post-show that revealed how the show is produced. And, unfortunately, the comment section was also dominated with hate comments towards a contestant's performance. Jesus, what did you, what did you do last time, Blaine? He didn't do anything wrong. I just made some moves. He did, his, he did his civic duty. People had thoughts. They've got your number. <laughs> Those were quickly brushed off and dismissed. Later, in the June 20th journal, it was announced that Murder Room was getting four more episodes to its series, and a podcast-formatted post-show for the pilot was now available to listen to. This post-show was available in the description via a link, but this link no longer works. Thankfully, it is still viewable thanks to the Wayback Machine. In the file, Becca, Blaine, Gus, and John sit down with Patrick Salazar, the creator and writer. They discuss clues they did not notice, elaborate more on the timeline, interview Patrick with a variety of questions, and give a little insight into the production of the episode. Let's explain what we're doing. This is I, this has been bothering me since we filmed, and I want to get this off my chest. Did we All get right. the guy? So, yes. so real Luckily. quick. Now, the four episodes promised in the journal did end up releasing to the public for free. You can watch them on YouTube if you like. The first video aired on August 15th, with a new episode releasing weekly through September 5th. Additionally, audio-only formats of the episodes released the same day on services like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Very little was changed about the show during the break. I mean, if it already worked, why change it? Here are a few things that were different, though. 
The four council members and voice cast were confirmed to be rotating positions with John remaining as the foreman, and a different murder case would be presented every episode instead of different people tackling the same one. The available callers were now revealed up front, like Jim's doctor or wife, Julia, instead of being vaguely described as caller. Some of the graphic interface was changed and simplified. In some episodes, the counselor are given some unprompted phone calls from people of interest. One episode had all the suspects' co-worker give additional information before the timer started, and another one, which happened abruptly in the middle of the investigation, from a passerby who recalls seeing a related mysterious parcel. Three timeouts were issued to the council, but only in the last episode, which allowed the timer to stop for a minute, allowing them to collect their thoughts. These could not be redeemed if the timer is below five minutes, and any phone calls that were on the line at that moment were put on hold until time resumes. And lastly, a proper post show was made called Murder Room After the Verdict. These videos released the day after the original episode's air date exclusively for first members. Unlike the pilot, the post show is filmed immediately after the deliberation and does not have an interview with Patrick. However, the show retains its podcast format as the council discusses their doubts, are revealed some more clues they missed, and are given a precise timeline. Reception of the season was positive overall. Some people had complaints over some of the game's rules, specifically the exoneration system. The episode Fit to be Killed clearly showed its potential flaws, as they backburned the suspect with the most possible information and was forced to interview the unknown killer with very little to go off of. After the exoneration, the council then received a mountain of potential questions they could have asked him. Regardless, fans wanted more, and it wasn't until eight months later until the show had any more news. Season 2 was announced via Twitter on May 17th, 2019, and a trailer was later released on the 30th. This new season contained six more episodes, which premiered June 2nd and aired weekly until July 7th. Again, some changes were made to the show in between seasons. The logo for the show was updated, and the graphic interface were given a new theme and aesthetic. The set was completely changed and overhauled, with almost every set piece being custom and not recycled from other productions. Timeouts became a staple in the rulebook and were available for the council to use in every episode of the season. Additionally, they could now be redeemed with 5 minutes remaining, as that was previously restricted. The episode length for After the Verdict shrunk immensely, going from 8 to 10 minutes to 3 to 6 minutes. Detective Mares became a recurring character. Portrayed by Patrick, he gives additional information before the timer begins and elaborates the complete timeline in the post show. Some episodes had their own gimmick. The fifth episode involved a murder at a circus, which led to the victim and suspects all being clowns. The circus's schedule and itinerary were provided instead of a timeline. Also, the season finale had two victims being discovered. In the middle of the episode, the council is stopped as another two bodies were found, which reset the clock as they began to collect more information about this supposed serial killer. And lastly, the show now allowed sponsors, which led to ad reads being added in between the video. Overall reception for the season was really positive. Any negative comments were debating the effectiveness of the backburner rule, stating it's better to put the most suspicious person on hold instead of least suspicious. Additionally, people mentioned that ad reads really interrupted the flow of the show and shouldn't be so intrusive. Now, before I let you go, I want to let you know there's a great way to keep yourself safe. Simply safe is an award winning. Lastly, the show was given its own panel during RTX Austin 2019 on July 7th, the same day the season finale aired, titled Making Murder Room. It was a way to show some behind the scenes insight and the production process of the show. After season two finished and the panel was held, there were no more additional news. The show was never given a proper cancellation or an announcement towards a new season. Once again, we are left to assume the status of the show. Personally, I think it could make a comeback in the future. It seems a little wasteful for the completely custom set to be used for only six episodes and never again. Also, with On The Spot now being complete, John could be able to squeeze in some time to resume his hosting position on Murder Room. Let's just hope our lovely computer friend Jessica can make a return in the future. As you can. Hey Mac! Did you do it? <laughs> <laughs>Pilot Month was a groundbreaking idea. It goes without saying that on the day of the original announcement, fans didn't expect every show to be a hit. It was almost expected that one show out of the five wouldn't make it past the pilot. However, the program proved very beneficial. Two of the shows that debuted became very successful, with one of them becoming a fan favorite and staple to the company's list of achievements. 
A third wasn't as fortunate, but still received a proper season and gathered its own group of fans. Only two could be considered a complete failure, but even saying that is debatable. Those two were promised more content, but had their plans fall flat due to a change in passion or lack of production time. Even though all five of these shows now rest in an uncertain state, we still have to appreciate the impact they left on the community and become hopeful for a miraculous statement that brings one back to life. We, the community, have a collective voice to make some executive decisions for the company. Our watch times decide the fate of their shows, and I think it's about time we all work together and free Gork from this shitty prison. Free Gork! Free Gork! Free Gork! Free Gork! Free Gork.